Major funding for NPT Reports, Aging Matters, is provided by the West End Home Foundation, enriching the lives of older adults through grant-making advocacy and community collaboration. The Jeanette Travis Foundation, dedicated to improving the health and well-being of the Middle Tennessee community. The HCA Foundation, on behalf of TriStar Health. Cigna HealthSpring. Additional funding provided by Jackson National Life Insurance Company, the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, and by members of NPT. Thank you. Part of our mission here at Nashville Public Television is to shine a light on issues that are important but don't always get talked about. In the production of the Companionship and Intimacy episode of NPT's Aging Matters series, we recognize that a discussion of aging, sexuality, and sexual health would be an informative and worthy topic for conversation. The following program will focus on human sexuality as a part of overall well-being across the lifespan. We'll discuss sexual activity, anatomy, and the connection to health with language that may not be appropriate for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Here to help us start this conversation are Ginger Manley, a retired nurse practitioner and certified sex therapist. She is author of Assisted Loving, The Journey Through Sexuality and Aging. Also, Dr. David Duong, urologist at Urology Associates in Nashville. And Renee Burwell, a certified sex therapist practicing at Pandora's Awakening and executive director of the Tennessee Alliance for Sexual Health. And finally, Brooke Fought a women's health nurse practitioner and director of the Women's Institute for Sexual Health, which is a division of Urology Associates. Thank you all for joining us. Thank Thanks for having us. us. All right, so let's get started. Why is it that we don't talk about sex in general in our society? It's taboo, isn't it? Yeah. I mean... Because our mamas and our daddies didn't talk about it sometimes, and we didn't learn how to talk about it except in four-letter words or things like that. And so what, what about, you know, aging and sexuality? Is that even more taboo? Like, you know, we're not going to talk about it in general, and now as older adults... Are you kidding? You want to know what your grandma and grandpa are doing? Of course <laughs> well, it's taboo. Well, everybody's taboos. hoping they're not doing anything. Yeah, that's right. Please don't tell us if they are. So yeah. it's, it's it, way more taboo to talk about um, older people and sexuality than it probably is about kids and sexuality. It's assumed that at a certain age, sex just stops. Our sexual thoughts and feelings just cease, and that couldn't be further from the truth. So is that idea that sexual um, uh, libido or desire declines with age, is that true? Is that a given? Is it inevitable? I see women of all ages, and you can speak to the male aspect of, of this, but I see women of all ages, and we know, according to multiple major landmark surveys, that low sexual desire or low libido occurs in women of all ages. Mm -hmm. um, distressing low sex drive occurs typically, or, or more so, between the ages of 45 to 64, um, and it's not so much that, that women beyond that age uh, don't have loss of sex drive, but they're not quite as bothered by it. So there's a difference mm -hmm. between do you have bothersome low sex drive versus just low sex drive that's not really impeding your, your daily functioning and your happiness. Now, when it comes to the male aspect... Well, in men, as men age, it's pretty common for our testosterone levels to slowly de decline. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, their libidos will decline as well. So that's pretty common. But not necessarily will it correlate with their lack of true desire within their social sphere to actually want to engage in sexual activity. I've got plenty of patients, and all urologists see plenty of patients who, on a regular basis, come in after the age of 60, the age of 70, the age of 80, who still want to have a vigorous sex life. Mm -hmm. And they're coming in for advice. I have counseling. 90 year olds in my practice. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and just to, so you're a urologist, let's just kind of back up. What, what is a urologist? What do you do? So urologists are surgeons of the urinary tract, the genital urinary tract. So we treat uh, kidney stones, kidney cancer, bladder disorders, uh, tumors of the prostate. Um, we also do sexual dysfunction, such as erectile dysfunction. And we also treat uh, hypogonadism, which is low testosterone. So there are a wide range of uh, disorders that we treat, most of them surgical. 
most of them social. And what about you, Women's Institute for Sexual Health? Like, what kind of uh, how do, what does that practice entail? Yeah, so I see women across the lifespan after the age of 16 to 18, and uh, I see women primarily with sexual and pelvic floor disorders and some urogynecologic conditions as well. But in the sexual sphere, I see uh, women with low sex drive, with arousal and orgasmic dysfunction, uh, sexual pain, vulvar skin disorders. Uh, we call it the land of lost toys because oftentimes women uh, come to us for things where they're just not getting the, the answers that they need for their health concerns in other places. All right, and then we have two sex therapists here. What is it that you do? Well, I don't practice sex therapy anymore, but I did for about 40 years. And um, I, what I did was listen to people's stories, a lot like what you were talking about, the land of lost stories. I, hundreds of times people said, I've never been able to talk to anybody about this. And so I heard many stories, stories of pain, stories of hope, stories of, of opportunities that people hoped would have that didn't come true. And um, many times what I, I, what I did was I provided them information, and that was enough to get them onto where they wanted to be. In other cases, there were people, though, that really needed more in, um, in-depth therapy, and so I was prepared to be able to do that sort of thing. So I worked with people with sexual trauma, with sexual um, um, addiction issues, people who couldn't stop their sexual behavior, as well as people who wanted to improve whatever they was going on with them. Mm -hmm. Renee, you know, not just uh, individual problems, or mm -hmm. you know, you also sort of try to edu educate professionals about how to talk about this? So one is, I'll piggyback off of you first. Um, I kind of look at myself as a person that deals with the emotional as well as the relational aspects of sexuality. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are coming if they're experiencing loss in, of functioning or they're experiencing some type of anxiety and I help them kind of cope with um, the grief of whatever that loss of function is and I also help them cope with um, different methods to kind of breathe and help them have a more holistic, mindful practice when it comes to their sexuality and sexual practices. Um, in addition to that, like you were saying about the professional aspect, I'd, we offer monthly lunch and learns for professionals because the reality is sex is one of the most um, not looked at aspects of our humanity in many different ways. Mm. And it's a part of our health care. And unfortunately, many health care providers, many social service providers um, do not know very much about sexual health as a totality. So that's what one of my goals is. As a person from Tennessee, I know I didn't get very much sex education. And I know that sex is from the womb to the tomb. So I want our professionals to be able to educate um, the clients and the community on what's good sexual health practices. So that's one of my personal goals. So what are the consequences about not talking about sex, particularly as we age? Well, at any age, the, the, there's a motto that I think fits wonderfully, and that is the greatest risk to our sexual health is silence. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make that up. Some One of my, uh, a mentor to me, uh, you has said that for years and I think it really fits because the things that we don't talk about are the things that have such power mm -hmm. such power to in the in the long run to just keep us prisoners and so um, I think that the importance of talking of educating at any age is giving people words giving people the freedom to be able to speak teaching them how to speak and in, in a mixed group as well as I mean women have been good at talking among themselves, but men almost never have a conversation about sexual or sexuality. And so getting this literally on the table and beginning to talk about it gives people a lot of freedom, gives them a, the ability to take the next step. Human beings are sexual beings. It's a, it's a part of uh, being a whole person. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make a connection between how uh, sexual activity and health could be related by what we value. Uh, and we uh, did a uh, recording at Vanderbilt School of Nursing, uh, a presentation, and uh, we're gonna show you a video, a clip from that lecture. I had a gentleman when I was a student who I saw who was a diabetic and his blood sugars on average were running between 300 to 450. And my preceptor told him over and over again that he needed to really, you know, here are the things you need to do. You've got to take your insulin. You've got to take your insulin. We need these to get down. It's going to have an impact on your cardiovascular health. It's going to have an impact on your kidneys, blah, 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 all these things. And this guy just, you know, he didn't feel bad. 
and everything was fine. So he didn't understand why he needed to do this. So my preceptor's telling me this, and he's like, and oh, by the way, sort of, he sort of throws this off as I'm going into the room to talk to the patient. He says, he's quite the man about town. So I went in and talked to him, and we chatted about it, and he showed me he was keeping track of his blood sugar levels, and that none of them were below 300. And so we're talking about it, and he's like, you know, I just don't feel bad. I just don't feel bad. And I was like, well, so I understand that you have, um, right now you have several people that you're seeing. And he's like, oh, yes, love the ladies. He was just sort of chatting. And I was like, well, you know, one of the side effects of hyperglycemia, especially prolonged hyperglycemia, is impotency. And he goes, what? I was like, you won't be able to have an erection. What? I mean, immediately just this look of horror on his face <laughs> and was like, so you're telling me that it potentially could cause me to have erectile dysfunction. And I was like, yep, it absolutely can. Well, I wish someone had told me that. Can you go over the insulin again with me? <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out and my preceptor was like, how did you do that? And I was like, I just figured out what was important to him. <laughs> Um, and he came back and his hemoglobin, C, hemoglobin A1C was slowly going down. So I was like, yes, victory. All right, Dr. Duong, does that speak to you, that clip there about how you could possibly encourage someone to take better care of their life? Absolutely. So sexual health, like so many aspects of our personhood, is very much tied to the rest of our health. Um, if we don't take care of our heart, if we don't take care of our uh, endocrine organs, then many different aspects of our bodies will break down. So patients with diabetes, patients who smoke, have an earlier onset and can actually trigger erectile dysfunction. And actually, as a urologist, it's been easier for me to convince bladder cancer patients to, th to stop smoking, to convince them that they might get ED rather than recurrent bladder cancer. And there's another aspect that's important as well. So Ian Thompson at the University of Texas in 2005 published an article in the Journal of American Medical Association that linked early onset erectile dysfunction with heart disease. So this study showed for the first time that early onset ED in certain men can predict heart attacks, which is significant. So for certain men who have ED, it's important for you to go out and also get a cardiac workout because who knows, maybe in a year or two you might have an acute heart event. So a year or two, yeah, erectile dysfunction could cue, could show that you'd be at risk for a heart attack up to a year or two in advance. That's right. It could be the canary in the coal mine. Hmm. And can we acknowledge that women's genitalia is analogous to male genitalia? Hmm. So everything is derived from the same original structures. That's right. And so women can experience the same phenomenon, so decreased arousal, decreased hmm. sensation, uh, difficulty achieving orgasm, and it's from the same potential um, things that you were talking about, Dr. Duong. Uh, so women that smoke, uh, women that have elevated cholesterol, women with diabetes, uh, anything that inhibits blood flow down into the genitals can impact sexual functioning. And those risk factors that you were discussing are the same for women. We just don't have the same published data on women as we do for men. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of sex ed do we need for older adults? Um, for me, I believe that we should always start off with pleasure and talking about how do you feel pleasure, how do you receive it, how do you give it, how do you make sure your partner's receiving it. Um, it when it comes to pain, talking about pain and different types of um, ways to alleviate that. What's your connection with your partners? I think wellness should be important, like you were talking about with cardiovascular health, making sure you're exercising, making sure if you're a woman you are stretching, moisturizing, lubricating. I think all of those things should be incorporated. I think communication skills. I think there should be some information on what does sex look like after cancer? What does sex look like after menopause? What does sex look like after erectile dysfunction or prostate cancer or when you can't have a ejaculatory response? Well, you can still have a sexual experience without having the actual ejaculation. So I think we need to start having those conversations. So that's what my ideal would look like. In fact, we um, sort of reached out to the community to offer a, a couple of uh, questions, you know, anonymous questions. And one of them was, is there ever a point where it's not healthy, it's no longer safe to have sex? Well, I think having sex is the, the key to it. Why are we talking about penis and vagina, intercourse, man on top? 
uh, two minutes total and it's over, or are we talking about a different kind of experience? And for most older people, it is a different kind of an experience. The, 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 the first one that I just described is a much more biologically driven experience, which is the way it often is when you're under 50. But over 50 and, and certainly into the 70s, there's a huge change that takes place in both men and women from about 70 on that um, it, it, it really does require new ways of doing things. So in, there's really no danger in having a good sexual experience, but you need to also be sure that you have things in, in place. For instance, one of the things that we were recently we were talking about before we came on the air is the recurrence of urinary tract infections in women after sex, which occurs all of women's lives. It's not something that happens just when you get older. But as you get older, oftentimes the, the symptoms of that go away and you don't really know that you have a urinary tract infection like you do when you're younger and you end up in an emergency room that's pretty scary because you had no symptoms at all. So that would be a situation where, yes, having sex is a wonderful thing to do, but you don't want that kind of an outcome to take place. And I think probably Brooke and Dr. Dewan can talk a little bit about how that can be prevented because, mm -hmm. in my opinion, that's a huge issue. Yeah, that's one of the, the biggest things I see after uh, menopause my, with my menopausal uh, female patients is uh, they come to see me, they have recurrent bladder infections, they have vaginal dryness, uh, painful sex, and oftentimes it's related to a condition called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. I'm sure that we've all heard of at vaginal atrophy. We, there's all other terms, atrophic vaginitis, vulval vaginal atrophy. It's all essentially the same thing. The newest terminology is GSM. Uh, but essentially what happens is with the, the prolonged deprivation of estrogen as well as testosterone, the vulvar and vaginal tissue begins to thin and the, uh, the skin cells that make up that tissue become less elastic. They don't lubricate like they used to. And that leads to the sensation of dryness and that may be with or without intercourse. Some women just experience chronic vaginal dryness. And in that sense, dry penetrative play, whether it's penis vagina penetration or using toys, fingers, whatever that might be, can lead to the urethra getting irritated, can lead to urethritis, which is a really painful condition, uh, and even a true infection. And as you stated, Ginger, that oftentimes women don't feel the sensation of a bladder infection, or if they do, that's unpleasant as well, just in and of itself. Uh, but that is one of the easiest conditions to, to treat, to be completely honest. It's simply replacing what was missed. And it, there's hormonal options and there's non-hormonal options. A lot of women choose to not seek treatment because they maybe don't want to use hormones. They're not educated on you know, the, the updates on how and when to use hormones and the difference between full body systemic hormones and localized vaginal hormones. But there's also non-hormonal approaches that can be used to treat that. So mm -hmm. even for my patients who are not currently sexually active, I still strongly endorse treatment for that condition because it does, it's chronic, it's progressive, it's just going to get worse without treatment. And women aren't the only ones who get UTIs mm -hmm. as they age. Men also get in more frequent urinary tract infections mm -hmm. as well, most likely due to enlarging prostate glands. And when the prostate enlarges, it shuts down the ability to empty very efficiently. And urine left in the bladder can serve as a culture medium for bacteria to grow. Mm -hmm. So the incidence of urinary tract infection in men also increases unless it's dealt with, either medically or surgically. And getting back to a point you raised earlier, which is quite interesting, after treatment for prostate cancer, oftentimes there's going to be erectile dysfunction. Whether it be with radiation or surgery, mm -hmm. those nerves, the cavernous nerves that govern the function of the penis can actually be affected quite significantly. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for us, there are now many different ways that we can address it, whether with oral therapy, injections, or even the installation of penile prostheses. I want to pick up on that too, though, because this brings back the question about is it safe to have sex? So let's say that a man is on any of the, the medications, the Viagra, the Levitra, the, in, any of those, and he's having a good experience with that. But let's say, for whatever reason, he gets a cold and his body's not functioning as well, but he still has uses the, the medication because it's Sunday morning and, hey, that's when he and his, his friend are going to get it on. And he's, his underlying condition is not so great, so then he gets up and he falls over, hits his head on the ground, ends up in the emergency room. You're absolutely right. Those kinds of things, that's the kind of things that don't sometimes get talked about 
when we talk about, oh, we have all these medications available now. Mm -hmm. So say a little bit well, about Well, once that. again, our sexual health is very much tied into our overall health. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always counsel my patients with, with respect to treating erectile dysfunction, is that they have to make sure that their cardiovascular health is on target, is they are healthy enough, their hearts are healthy enough to sustain the physical strain, the, the activity of sex itself. Do older adults need to be worried about sexually transmitted infections? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody who's having sex needs to be worried about sexually transmitted infections. At and any age. Well, we did talk to a, a national expert on uh, sexuality and aging, and kind of I kind of posed this question of, should we be worried about these sexually transmitted infections? Is it blown out of proportion? Is it just hyper-focused by the media? Uh, and here's what uh, Dr. Stacy tesler Lindell had to say. I worked with a design student several years ago and he created the phrase, age is not a condom. And the point there is age alone doesn't protect us from sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. And we do see HIV and other sexually transmitted infections in the older adult population. Um, so on the one hand, we should have safe sex. On the other hand, the incidence of most sexually transmitted infections among people in their 60s, 70s, 80s and older is very low. There is not, to my eye, evidence of a massive pandemic of sexually transmitted infection among older adults. That's just, unfortunately, we see more sexually transmitted infections in children under the age of 14 than we do in the older adult population as a percentage. We should be really worried about that. I remember being in that interview and hearing that statistic that the prevalence of STIs is higher for 14 and under than it is for 65 and older. So when the media focuses on older adults and sexually transmitted infections, do you feel like that's a distraction, that it's just a misunderstanding, that it's not? I think we tend to shame sex in general. Mm -hmm. We come from a very Puritan society where anything that pertains to pleasure, sex, drugs, food, etc., we put a negative connotation on it. I tell people, I'm like, sex should be just as normal as brushing your teeth and how we have these conversations. And we're okay with talking to kids about brushing their teeth, but when it comes to having a condom or even feminine hygiene products, we don't want to have any of those kind of, kinds of conversations. But little kids can have toy guns, they can have bloody axes, and they're completely innocent. But let it be about sex, and then all of a sudden it's not. Mm -hmm. And the same thing as people get older, we want to look at them as innocent too. So we end up kind of wanting to ignore the topic. We tend to want to put a lot of shame and, and put scare tactics so people won't do it. And instead, we need to kind of change that framework where we are actually talking about how to have healthy practices because if we talk about it in the light, people won't be doing all these poor things in the dark. And that's what's happening. It's like people are in nursing facilities and other places where they can't have privacy or different spaces. So they're doing things in hidden spaces and in a pro, well, not in the most, not in the most healthy way mm. because they don't have the opportunity to do things um, in the light and actually talk to people like, hey, maybe I want a condom. Who do you ask for a condom when you're in a facility? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I gotta find those in the bathrooms of the assisted living facilities. You don't. Another thing about that that I like to acknowledge with my patients and with my colleagues is using proper terminology. So oftentimes my patients come in and this is of all ages and they have various terms to, to discuss with me their genital anatomy or their erogenous zones. And half the time, I don't know what they're saying to me, you know? Yeah. And so, and then oftentimes- well, That's cross-cultural too. So it is, so it is, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, oftentimes when I'm trying to explain to women about vaginal dryness or, or painful sex or whatever that might be, they have difficulty understanding me because when I'm using proper terms or how to utilize a product, they're not sure where it goes or what structure I'm referring to. So I, I feel like sex education in the United States is definitely behind a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. And by starting out early on, we build the, um, the knowledge base that older adults may need. Well, in fact, you mentioned sort of the baby boomers and the sexual revolution, and of course we know that the, the aging population is not a monolith, right? Like it's a lot of uh, different folks, and folks may not be comfortable talking about sex. Absolutely. People who were a part of the sexual revolution were really only a small proportion of the baby boomers, and there were plenty of other people who were going to war, coming home from war, running their families, going to church, doing all the kinds of things that are on the other side of what the sexual revolution in terms of the liberality of that um, uh, 
uh, seems to show. So we have plenty of people who retain those traditional values, conservative values. Churches continue to promote those in many ways. And so we find that, that just as Brooke was talking about, people don't have the language, they don't have the comfort, they don't have the experience to be able to talk about this. And it just makes me so happy when somebody can finally reach a point where they can feel validated for any, their own experience. And that's really what Tennessee Alliance for Sexual Health is about, is helping professionals to have the language to talk to their clients. So it's automatically destigmatizing the conversation around sex. I'm like, before anyone even asks you if they have any sexual health concerns, you need to be asking them, do they have sexual health concerns? Do they have any concerns around pleasure? On top of that, I always like to say, let's do a top-down approach. That's with the professionals, but bottom up, you know, we have some great shows out right now, like Grace and Frankie. You know, it's very sex positive, and it talks about aging across the, the and sex across the lifespan. And I think we need to have more shows that kind of acknowledge sexuality, more conversations in churches and other places. But there's a lot of room for us to grow when it comes to bringing this topic. So. Uh, older adults feel comfortable talking about it versus it always being reactionary. Real quick, um, yeah. <laughs> my former life before I got into sex therapy is I used to do long-term care as a social worker. So one, some of the situations that would happen is sometimes when people are going through Alzheimer's, the frontal cortex is limited and their inhib inhibitions are pretty limited. Mm -hmm. So you'll have people in memory care units that are having sex with multiple people, you know, whenever they get a chance. And people will say, they'll come to me as a social worker like, oh, Renee, you need to move her out of here or move him out of here. And it's like, we need to have conversations about how do we incorporate this person's sexuality, mm -hmm. even with memory loss, even with a lot of different things. But the thing is, we're always waiting until something happens that's jarring for people versus actually being proactive with, let, let's start having these conversations before they even have to come to the table, mm -hmm. so. And last takeaways, I mean, if someone has, uh, a concern uh, that is affecting their sex life, they should see maybe seek medical care for that because it could be uh, mm -hmm. vital to their health, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Happy to see them. And, so they sh and they should not stop with the first or the second or the third or the fourth person who turns their back on them and will not answer the question. They need to keep going till they can find somebody who can help because there are plenty of people. There are physicians, there are nurse practitioners, there are phys pelvic floor physical therapists, there are counselors, a whole variety of people that weren't there 10 or 15 years ago. So it's really, really good to be aging and having those kind of resources today that weren't there before. And I'm right there aging myself and I'm really glad they're all there for me. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we've run out of time. I want to thank each of our panelists for contributing to this conversation and thank you for watching. To find all of the programs in NPT's Aging Matters series, visit our website, wnpt.org slash agingmatters. Thanks. Major funding for NPT Reports, Aging Matters, is provided by the West End Home Foundation, enriching the lives of older adults through grant-making, advocacy, and community collaboration. The Jeanette Travis Foundation, dedicated to improving the health and well-being of the Middle Tennessee community. The HCA Foundation, on behalf of TriStar Health. Cigna HealthSpring. Additional funding provided by Jackson National Life Insurance Company, the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, and by members of NPT. Thank you.